Hello and welcome to another edition of Harona and I am Harona Drame. Today I have a special guest for the chairman of TRRC, Truth, Reconciliation and Reparations Commission, Mr. Lamin Sisi. I begin by asking him uh, his growing up in Bansang in rural Gambia. Thank you very much. It's my pleasure uh, to come and meet you here and uh, share with you uh, my own background. I was um, born and raised in Bansang, went to primary school in Bansang, and uh, then uh, secondary school Armitage. Bansang uh, is, uh, I think, probably was founded as uh, a trading post. Mm -hmm. And uh, my grandfather was not the founder, back at Dabo, he was uh, uh, one who really helped him uh, dance and grow into a large trading post mm -hmm. and uh, also uh, uh, helped him uh, increase the presence of uh, traders from different parts of the country and uh, that spur that gave him a rise um, to good economic activity uh, in the region. But growing up those days in Bansang, I mean, I know now our generation, we have the computers, we have the Game Boys, we have the Playstations, the PS3s, PS4s. Your generation, what was so remarkable about your childhood that you remember now with fond memories, things you played with, uh, the friends, the, 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 the extracurricular activities that you would do those days? It was more growing up with friends rather than toys and uh, computers and a Game Boy and uh, things of that nature. We didn't get that. But growing up with your own peers, growing up within um, uh, in a family that is really close-knit um, uh, group, that helped a lot. And that that uh, really does uh, provide a good foundation for uh, kids um, uh, growing up at that time. Mm -hmm. in the area. Of course, um, uh, school came a bit later mm -hmm. uh, and uh, the books and the things that we, are, uh, we were introduced um, to uh, helped out a lot as well. Stories were different from mm -hmm. what you read in the books mm -hmm. and uh, from what you hear uh, uh, when families sit in the evening to tell stories um, uh, to each other like that. Aware of entertaining. So there was no television. So people would sit around and uh, just um, uh, tell stories um, uh, to each other. Talking about telling stories, um, a lot of uh, rural Gambia still, you have a grandparent or an elderly person in a village uh, telling tales around a fireplace at night. I still find that very fascinating. The, were you, did you uh, experience that? And then the Karanta culture, which is the Islamic uh, teaching, sometimes people will do it in the evenings around a fireplace. Those are typical activities in the rural area. Yes, indeed. Uh, storytelling was part of it, part of that culture. Still recall lots of those summer stories. Years later, when I was um, studying abroad and then come um, uh, to Bansang, mm -hmm. uh, I would make recordings of my um, people telling those um, stories. Uh, they are, the stories were somewhat universal. Mm -hmm. You travel around the world, you hear similar stories. Aesop's of my fables is mm -hmm. uh, uh, an example of mm -hmm. that. Parents um, uh, teach their children, mm -hmm. as I said, the culture of uh, bonding, the culture of getting together. Mm -hmm. uh, kids um, uh, learn a lot um, from their parents and from the elders at that time. The ethos, the rules in, the, in that situation mm -hmm. were very clear. What kids would do, how you respect them with parents, how you cooperate in uh, doing the chores around the house. Mm -hmm. uh, all those things were part of um, uh, the upbringing of the kids. And then the school, of course, added them um, uh, an element that was relative, that was new to the culture. 
new to the culture. We're going to take our first break now. When we come back, we'll talk about what happened when Lamin Sise left the Bansangs and the Makates for the towns and cities. Stay with us. This is Harana. Welcome back to Harona with my special guest Lamin Sise, chairman of the TRRC. Mr. Sise, so, do you grow up in the village? Well, I don't know if Bansang those days will be referred to as a town, which it is today. And in the Makatis, did you come to Batas? Did you come to Banjul? Found out that a lot of people had to come to Banjul to make something of their lives after the initiation and early childhood education? Uh, my growing up was almost exclusively rural, <laughs> provincial. No, I didn't come to Banjul to go to school. The first time I came to Banjul was in 1961 <laughs> during the uh, royal visit. Queen Elizabeth was visiting the Gambia and uh, I was uh, uh, in Form 3 in Armitage. Mm -hmm. uh, the pupils and the students were all transported <laughs> from uh, Armitage, from Georgetown to Banjo. That was my very first uh, visit to Banjo. Mm -hmm. I was a bit curious <laughs> what Bathurst, as it was then, looked like. I remember we were traveling on uh, the the steamship that uh, uh, traveled up river called Lady Wright mm -hmm. and uh, the early morning arrival in Bathurst mm -hmm. uh, I was um, uh, really looking forward to what um, uh, this place looked like. Got to the front part of um, uh, the boat mm -hmm. I mean the, sh uh, the ship Lady Wright and uh, so Lights some are from some distance. Mm -hmm. Streets were street lights of banjo. Mm -hmm. I had never seen street lights, and uh, so I was curious. Look at these lights some are from this distance mm -hmm. in the area, and uh, so that's what um, uh, Bathurst, the capital, looked like. Anyway, we finally got to the harbour, mm -hmm. and uh, there were uh, lorries waiting for us there mm -hmm. to transport us from the. Uh, port, mm -hmm. <coughs> excuse me, to uh, to Yundum College, where <laughs> we were housed them uh, in uh, the main hall, the assembly hall. Uh, the only time I came close to Banjul again was uh, Yundum College. When I finished Ampte, went to Yundum College, and occasionally come to uh, Banjul. I still don't know Banjul at all. I still don't know the Combo area very well. Still very very tied to my rural. Um, uh, uh, beginnings. I would assume you don't know Bansang that well anymore anyways. Yes. <laughs> no, not at all. On the contrary. I know you Bansang do? very well. You do. I would, um, uh, I said my, my um, uh, links um, uh, with my roots are um, uh, very, very tight, uh, very, very close. So every year I would visit Bansang. I would have to uh, be in Bansang for at least um, three weeks in a year. Otherwise, oh. I can't function outside. When I was a student, uh, hmm. both in the uh, US and the UK, I would come in to visit my family, visit my old man. If I didn't um, see my father spend three weeks in Bansang, I can't function. And literally, I meant that. I could not. I had to come in, go back to my roots, hang around with the people. Every, I know every single corner of that area. And when I first came back, after having been away for about four years or so, hmm. They thought that uh, uh, a past would have forgotten yes. uh, Mandinka and they forget the names of people. Mm -hmm. They were shocked uh, when uh, that everyone didn't came forget. in and then I'll just call him by name. You see, I'm in a mole. I'll call them and then go around also. Uh, and that thing. No, uh, I, I love my roots. I think it's the strength that, I, that gave me. It gave me the strength to really function. Um, outside. Your professional career, how did it start? I mean, I know for all of us, um, in most cases, while in primary school or early in high school, you will start to make career choices of what you would want to do for the rest of your life. What was yours? Armitage School 
equals everything for me. The training, the exposure that we had mm -hmm. to international affairs, or we used to call it current affairs. Mm -hmm. The library, mm -hmm. I was for two years the school librarian. It exposed me to lots of things in the library, mm -hmm. in organizing the, the, the common room. Mm -hmm. Newspapers, radio, listening to the BBC as a teenage boy. Mm -hmm. So the attraction to international affairs started very early mm -hmm. in my career. And uh, it continued. That hasn't changed one bit. And uh, when I finished um, uh, that uh, time in Armitage, went on to Yundum College. Mm -hmm. And uh, my focus was still very much on international issues. Uh, at some point, their interest then focused mm -hmm. again on the United Nations. Mm -hmm. uh, I would organize a few people and then say, let's discuss issues that you have before the UN. Of course, this was the period also of uh, independence for African countries. Mm -hmm. So the interest that we had on that sort of uh, reinforced uh, the ideas and other things about international community, international organizations perhaps getting together to assist uh, these uh, countries to become independent. Mm -hmm. So the interest goes back um, to that uh, moment and that's why I ended up at the UN. How, how did you, I mean, <coughs> from Bansan, usually it's uh, who you know, uh, what attractions you have, um, how well you do in school, but primarily most of these international jobs is somewhat related to knowing people and having knowledge. Well, I'm not sure that coming from rural Bansan, I would know anybody, or that anybody would know um, about Bansan, by families and the people coming there. I think, as I said, Armitage was the, the one that mm -hmm. instilled in me the curiosity about the world. How do you do it? Um, no, I didn't. I didn't um, uh, uh, know anybody as such that would meant to me mm -hmm. from Bansang days. Had great teachers in Armitage, no doubt about it. Those teachers were the ones I'm, uh, personally I would give credit credit to. The other day I met um, uh, uh, Principal uh, uh, Mr. Gabriel Roberts, yes. and I was thanking him enormously. He was my teacher uh, A-level. Ah, I see. Yeah. So I told him, Master, so we used to call him, mm -hmm. said, uh, you, uh, I thank you for everything. Yeah. Things that I did later on, years later, you gave me the ground. You expose them, uh, us to everything in the area. Kekudo Mani, Jankun Jai, Dundin Jai, you name them. S.A. Juf, C.J. Sanyang. They were all great teachers that gave us the foundation uh, for what we ended up um, uh, doing later on in the area. But I, when I finished my Yundam College, I went to teach in Gain Sanjal for a year and then decided that, uh, look, I want to uh, uh, get further education. Again, mm -hmm. left practically on my own from Bansan. Uh, September 5th, 1966, left Bansan without any money in my pocket. Mm -hmm. I wasn't taking any back way. My focus was on education. Mm -hmm. Education was everything. Mm -hmm. I went to the car, had a TM, an uncle there who was running a high school. Mm -hmm. He said, Can you come and teach a uh, year here? while you de uh, p uh, decide on going to UK or US. Mm -hmm. I went in there, taught for a year. In that high school, mm -hmm. I again continued my interest in international affairs. I had, a, I had organized a huge activity and a club uh, for young people for the United Nations. Uh, I had done that before leaving Indian College uh, I was secretary of the Students' Union there, 
we were all involved in West African Students Union for the United Nations. Mm -hmm. And uh, after teaching in Dakar for a year, mm -hmm. I then went to, Ma to uh, Madrid, did my uh, uh, university entrance examination, summer qualifications at GCEs mm -hmm. and uh, SAT. I wasn't too sure what, um, uh, uh, where I would want to go. Just mm -hmm. say, get the qualifications that we weren't getting in Armitage, because mm -hmm. Armitage was not prepared at that time to um, do GCE. So if you're ambitious, you've got to do it on your own, mm -hmm. which is what I did. By the time I finished the year in Madrid, the university there had uh, enough qualifications to enter the University of Madrid. They gave me admission, but I also had admission at uh, universities in the United States. Columbia University in New York mm -hmm. and the University of California uh, in Santa Barbara. I didn't have any funds to, to, to pay my way there. The time. And they weren't giving first year students scholarship. Uh, scholarship. So I went in to work as a Bindan mm -hmm. for a family that I used to uh, wash diapers for their kids on the US base in, uh, in Torrejon in Madrid. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I spent a year a year in Washington working as a Bindan uh, until I finally got myself uh, a job on the side while I was going to, uh, to school. I then got to Johns Hopkins University mm -hmm. uh, in Baltimore where I stayed. But for me, the focus was on education. Mm -hmm. I thought um, uh, in any area, that's the only thing that um, uh, uh, can really make you move on mm -hmm. in life. Without it, I don't think I'm, uh, I could have gone anywhere. Anyway, stayed at Thomas Johns Hopkins, did my uh, bachelor's, uh, master's, and the PhD, mm -hmm. and I still was not ready. I thought mm -hmm. uh, if I wanted to work for international organizations in a legal capacity, started mm -hmm. now getting focusing a bit mm -hmm. on uh, international relations and the international law. Mm -hmm. So I decided I need to go to law school, get a law degree as such. This is after the PhD? After the PhD. What did you have the PhD on? Uh, international affairs, international relations. Mm -hmm. Then I went to the University of Cambridge in England mm -hmm. to do my LLB there. Mm -hmm. I did my LLB in Cambridge and uh, so I said to people afterwards that, how can you come from rural bands? I didn't have any proper shoes on mm -hmm. until I was about 14, 15 years old. Mm -hmm. What they call pat pat in your hand. Yeah. That was the only thing that I had. Pat in your hand. Yeah, pat in your hand. <laughs> that was the thing that you put on yeah. in the area. But not the And it's those shoes made out of tires. Yeah, out of rubber. Uh, rubber. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Automobile tires. Yes. Here and there. It didn't bother me one bit. It still doesn't bother me. Mm -hmm. And it made me even love Bansom more, love my parents, and be with them and family. Family is still a big um, thing for me. Mm -hmm. And, uh, but those days were in terms uh, things that I look back on with regret and the things that, no. They shaped you. And they prepared me. Yes, They exactly. did this and that. So after getting uh, the LLB in Cambridge, I got uh, uh, sometimes the advantage about these big name schools. Even when I was finishing my master's at Johns Hopkins, the School of Advanced International Studies, you get job offers. Mm -hmm. That's the advantage that they have. Mm -hmm. There was an offer for me when I finished the master's at the Johns Hopkins to go to uh, Citibank, that is uh, what is now Citibank. It was the first national bank of New York mm -hmm. to go in and work as a banker. And they did everything to get me. No, I was uh, uh, admitted into the PhD program. I said, I'm going to continue education. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, in Cambridge, when I finished, the World Bank recruited me mm -hmm. and uh, went back to Washington, uh, mm -hmm. worked briefly at the World Bank, uh, looking at bank investment uh, from legal and economic point of view uh, mm -hmm. in Indonesia. But my interest was really more the UN. Mm -hmm. And uh, then I ended up having, I uh, had three offers from the UN and uh, uh, and the World Bank wanted me to stay very mm -hmm. badly. I decided that uh, I would, uh, I would uh, uh, 
uh, look at uh, the three of us from the UN mm -hmm. and the World Bank said my offer. And of the four, now uh, I decided to go to take the position of Deputy Legal Advisor of the United Nations Conference on Trade and Development in Geneva. The bank people thought I was nuts. Mm -hmm. I said, them, everybody wants to come and work for the World Bank. Yes. Who Where would you want to go to the UN? You? Where do you want to go? To the UN? And of all places in the UN, UNCTAD. Mm -hmm. But UNCTAD had some positive things that were going on. Very attracting, attractive by my things that, my, that, uh, that got me interested. They were, it was then that, that, I mean, then they were working on the new international economic order. What do you do to help developing countries here and there? They were great, um, third world intellectuals mm -hmm. uh, in UNCTAD in Geneva. Mm -hmm. And I, I thought um, uh, being exposed to these people would probably help a bit in that area. So did that, took the Geneva offer, went in there, worked six, six seven years. The legal office in New York at the United Nations um, asked me to transfer. And I went in there, 17 years of uh, work. I thought that the legal work maybe that's enough. Yeah. And then I linked up with the former Secretary General Kofi Annan, Kofi Annan uh, in the Department of Peacekeeping Operations for two, three years. And when he became Secretary General, mm -hmm. it was very close to him. Mm -hmm. So we uh, went to the office of the Secretary General. Welcome back to Harona, and this is the last segment with uh, Lamin Sise, Chairman of the TRRC. Mr. Sise, quite a, an interesting career um, and then now I'm assuming you've retired but not tired oh. and now you're taking on a new challenge which is very new to Gambia and Gambians this truth and reconciliation commission it's had people like me wondering from day one Small society, small Gambia, everybody knows everybody. Are we not opening a can of worms with this commission? Excuse me, I don't, I don't think you're opening a can of worms for uh, revisiting a very difficult history. To heal a people, a society that's been uh, damaged, that's been uh, that suffered. You would need to know the truth first. You would need to find a way of um, establishing that truth um, uh, perhaps uh, impartially and then uh, attempt to reconcile. They are not um, uh, easy things to do, especially um, uh, when uh, the background has been a tough one. Hmm. Gambiaism has been lucky to a great extent that Truth and Reconciliation Commission mm -hmm. uh, issue here was not preceded by a bloody civil war. Mm -hmm. Hundreds and thousands of people being killed, mm -hmm. sometimes um, uh, over a stretch of um, uh, many years, and sometimes a very quick one, mm -hmm. as it happened in Kenya, end of uh, 2007, uh, mm -hmm. early 2008, the elections, yeah. and there uh, was electoral violence that occurred there very quickly. Mm -hmm. Gambia did not go through that um, uh, bloody thing. What it went through that still would need um, uh, truth telling is uh, uh, brutal dictatorship. Uh, disappearance of, um, among people, mm -hmm. I mean, of, of people here and there. People not knowing what happened to their, uh, to their uh, relatives. It was the collapse of um, a governance mm -hmm. and uh, gross violations of human rights. You can't correct them with these things, and that's where some turn around and say, look, let bygones be bygones, this has happened, let's move on. No, you can't move on if you don't. Um, uh, know what exactly happened. And this is what the TRRC is bringing out now. People heard about um, difficulties during the 22 years of the uh, Jame uh, regime. They didn't know exactly what, is ha what, what happened. Now they're hearing it um, from victims themselves. 
been hearing it from perpetrators. Mm -hmm. We're just beginning our work. Uh, it's something that uh, uh, the life of the commission is two years. We are only a few months into, into it. Uh, so there's more to come in the area. But yes, indeed, in order to reconcile, in order to heal, you must know exactly what is happening. That is not uh, reopening um, uh, past history and the difficult thing that they had, uh, the country has gone through. I have lived most of these 22 years in this country and it's shocking for me as a journalist, as a person who had worked in close proximity and uh, being in the public domain. For me, there was a parallel country. There was the Gambia that we wake up to every day, go to work, come back, and there was a shadow country that is totally different. And it's unbelievable for me. Some of the revelations, <coughs> some of the things, to think that I wake up in the same country all those years, exact moments, and I am for the first time hearing about certain things. I mean, you would hear the radio kankangs and the gossips over the streets, but the gravity of what is being revealed now, in contrast, is dwarfed. Yeah. And that's what um, uh, TRRC is provided, that opportunity for people to know exactly what happened. This is not radio kankang now. This is reality. A victim coming, testifying what um, uh, they had endured. Perpetrator coming, uh, confessing to murder. The stories that I started hearing, I could not believe I didn't recognize my country. I say, even where I'd been out um, for years, mm. I do come here every year, every year, spend three, four weeks summer in Bansang and the rural areas. But I did not recognize the Gambia through that kind of a thing. I said, I, I thought we were a peaceful people. Mm -hmm. We were a very tolerant people very forgiving. I said maybe the youngsters who took um, a power here in 1994 took advantage of that. The fact that the people are peaceful, they're tolerant, they would forgive easily and you thought that you could um, uh, walk over them, perpetrate this kind of brutality. What one hears is shocking, absolutely shocking. However, we would need to look at that, we would need to find a way of um, uh, reconciling and certainly not term of forgetting justice. The act um, which established um, the TRRC does provide them um, for those who carry great responsibility for this uh, uh, outrageous um, crimes, violations of human rights and uh, abuses of human rights that they be held um, account, uh, to account for this uh, uh, thing. Uh, the TRRC, when it looks at um, uh, all these things, evidence um, uh, all um, uh, given out, it would then uh, make a recommendation for those who uh, carry great responsibility for these uh, uh, crimes mm -hmm. uh, to be prosecuted. And that recommendation goes to the Attorney General, and of course they would have to go through their own system finding out because they're only getting recommendation from the TRRC and if they came to that conclusion that yes indeed these people should be prosecuted then they would go ahead and prosecute but there is some uh, there isn't going to be just escape like that for everybody no I don't think so well you you're going a couple of steps ahead of me sorry but but let me let me come back now the idea is seeking the truth and the absolute truth. Now, two things have featured very recently. Of course, I'm not going to name names, but we've seen some witnesses deliberately trying to mislead or trying to hide the truth. But we've also seen outsiders outside who are potential uh, witnesses to come are already calling and influencing others as to what they can or cannot say uh, to the TRRC. 
How do you see that affecting your work? Well, if they are, if to use your first time, I wonder the analogy, I mean, the issue of um, misleading. They can come in and think that they would do that. At the end of the day, we would have to, we would get to the, get to the truth and then see what it is. They can, they can think that they're misleading the uh, public, they're misleading the commission. The commission would um, uh, get down to the bottom of the thing and then find out what exactly um, had happened. If they're responsible, then. Mm -hmm. Now, those who are interfering with witnesses, uh, the rules are very clear with that. TRRC is not a court of law, but TRRC has um, been given characteristics that are similar in some areas mm -hmm. as a court of law. And uh, interfering with witnesses uh, is a crime. And uh, those issues are being addressed. Anytime there is some evidence that uh, there is some um, thing like that, mm -hmm. actions would be taken. Of course, um, with respect to um, respecting their rights and uh, other things as well. Is that maybe allegations have been made here and there. Uh, you have to <laughs> not repeat the jammy years, mm -hmm. not respecting the rule of law, the uh, rights of the accused, and uh, uh, we see how things go. But no, they're not going to get away with that. No, would them, uh, anyone who thinks that uh, they're just coming thinking that they are fooling their commission and then saying things that they want to um, say and then think they would get away with it. No, they're not likely to get away with it at all. Not likely to get away with it. The issue of safety, security. People come out there. Wounds are freshen up. Some of the children in the 1994s and the 96 and the 97s who probably were as young as two, three, four, five years old don't remember much of some of these incidents. They're grown folks now and they're hearing for the first time details. I, what measures are we putting in place to ensure that true, you would come and confess your sins but you will not be mobbed in the streets of Banjul for just saying the truth as it was. Well, the earlier point that I made about um, uh, Gambians being generally very tolerant people, very forgiving, uh, uh, perhaps is the thing that one can fall back on. When you say safety, security, from people, yes, witnesses, some may be a bit nervous that uh, if they came out, something could happen to them. Nothing has happened. If um, uh, 2017, when the Jammeh regime collapsed, it was not followed. I said, what I personally feared, I thought that was going to there was going to be massive violence in this area. Mm -hmm. No, there wasn't anything. The political party that he established is running. They hold rallies in the area. Mm -hmm. You don't hear people going around um, uh, uh, killing uh, APRC people, arresting them, doing this and that and that. It shows the tolerance of the people. Mm -hmm. I think. So even with these witnesses coming out, it's a, diff it's a tough one. Mm -hmm. Yes, indeed, it's a tough one for the father who would have killed somebody mm -hmm. and never said anything to his um, children mm -hmm. about what he had done mm -hmm. and now he has to face his children and say I murdered them my people yes. get in there that's a yes. problem for him he may not he can, he can get out perhaps would not um, be uh, attacked in some other countries the guy would <laughs> he would need a, a huge security detail outside our hearings mm -hmm. as soon as this person comes out only they would go after him mm -hmm. but no not here and we hope that um, uh, that would continue until the Commission uh, uh, comes to some conclusion and uh, what recommendations we make um, to, the, uh, to the Attorney General. Come to conclusion, you're not a court of law, understandably. Now, how do we ensure justice prevails? How can you bring people to book? Because there will be that need. Ultimately, uh, your recommendations somewhat must identify uh, even if it's a small group of people who will bear ultimate responsibility and how do you bring them to buck?
do you even have the capability as a commission to do such? Well, ours is some, uh, uh, again, recommendation mm. to the Attorney General. The Attorney General can agree with us, with our findings, or they can disagree with our findings, and then mount their own investigation and say, you guys have gone into this and that and that, we will um, uh, do our own investigation then, and uh, then uh, uh, prosecute them if they came to that um, conclusion. Now, where the, uh, as I said, the commission's um, thing, many would say, or mm -hmm. uh, would have doubts about recommendations, is that in many of these um, uh, instances, recommendations are made and they just sit there, no one would implement them. But again, the challenge is for the Commission, perhaps to come up with uh, some mechanisms, some suggestions that would avoid the recommendation just sitting and the gathering dust on the shelf in the area. Yes, there are ways of um, uh, coming to that. We haven't come to any conclusion yet. How do we get um, uh, our guys, um, uh, the people who are getting the rec recommendations from us, to make sure that um, uh, they are. these are real, they are acted upon. Mm -hmm. So at some point we will come to that. I think we're very much aware of that. Away from the TRRC, let's say some provincial boy is watching this interview. I have no connections anywhere. All I have is my ambition and I want to be a Lamin Sise someday. What's the word of advice you'll have for this young fella? I stay in school. Stay in school. Uh, be with your family. Family is a very, very, very strong pillar. And uh, be yourself. I haven't changed one bit. I go back to my rural areas. You see me with my rural folks. You think of, uh, this guy's never gone out of this place. As I said, that gives you strength in the area. But school and the foundation here and there. Uh, forget about my um, older men. As I said, I started with Padinjeh. I did not have my proper shoes until I was about 15, 16 years old. And it didn't bother me. I wasn't too eager also to say that uh, I have to have this, I have to have that. If not, I'll take the back way. Back way, you're, you're crazy. You go into back way, there you die. But even if you succeed in crossing the Mediterranean, you end up um, doing things in the area that uh, wouldn't help you in, the, in one summer future. Unless you say, yeah, if you send $50, uh, to your parents, somebody, they like that, that this is it. That's a very short-term thing. It might help them, but your future is not getting anywhere at all. So for, for a rural boy in that area, stay in school, prepare yourself for the future. There's a great future for our continent, our region. And it's not just everybody going out there uh, and getting things. So yes, some of us, uh, perhaps they might get through certain things here and there, but it does not, it, it doesn't mean that uh, it's all uh, sugar and honey on that side of, um, in that side, I mean, that side of the world. No, not at all. The rural boy in the Bansang would say, just do your schooling, commit yourself um, to uh, helping this country. There's a great future here. Thank you very much, uh, Chairman Lamin Sise. It's been an absolute pleasure having you on the program, Harana. My pleasure. Thank you very much indeed. Thank uh, you. It's my pleasure to be with you. Thank you. Thank you.